About um, almost 15 years ago, I had the uh, opportunity to go and spend some time, about a week, with a pastor, and uh, it was a practicum. So I spent a week with this guy, and there was about 20 uh, other students that had a chance to do this. And um, it was really a privilege. He's a very wise and seasoned pastor. And I remember during that time, he impressed upon us uh, many things. One of the things that he talked about was as leaders, we need to be learners. We need to be continually um, learning. And uh, he made this interesting statement. He said that um, we need to learn from the bad as well as the good. And he said, you know, if you only learn from those who are good, then you're going to miss out on 50% of all that God wants to teach you. And I, I thought about that. And I thought, wow, that's, a, that's really wise. Um, we can learn, obviously, from those who are good, walking in the ways of the Lord. Um, we can learn from our own personal experiences. But we also can learn from the bad, those who are not walking with the Lord, or even our own experiences where we failed. It's uh, interesting he said, uh, uh, wisdom, wise people learn not just from their own mistakes. Wise people learn from other people's mistakes. And when you look at the Proverbs, the Proverbs uh, oftentimes will put in juxtaposition to one another uh, different types of people. The wise are compared to the foolish. The righteous are compared to the wicked. The humble are compared to those who are proud. And what the scripture is telling us there is that you need to observe even those who are not walking in the path of righteousness because there's something for for us as we observe their life as well. And this is important to us, especially as we continue our Advent series because we're talking about today seeing Christ through the eyes of King Herod. King Herod is someone who uh, we would not consider very wise or godly at all. And yet there's something in his life that could teach us. There's something about looking at him that we could then gain wisdom from. Okay, so we're going to be looking at uh, King Herod. And I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. So if you could, go ahead and stand with me as I read this passage. This is uh, the story of Jesus' birth. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet. 
Out of Egypt I called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Go ahead and have a seat. One of the things I love about the scriptures is the way the scriptures intersect with uh, history. We follow the word of God. We follow the Lord. And what's fascinating is that Jesus Christ came into history. And so I love it when uh, biblical, uh, the biblical account intersects with secular history. And so we know a lot about King Herod, uh, especially from a historian named Josephus. Uh, a little, let me give you a little background about Herod. Herod was an Edomite. What does that mean? An Edomite was a descendant of Esau. So what? Well, Esau, if you remember, Abraham had one of his sons was Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, Jacob and Esau. The Edomites come from Esau. And so Herod is an Edomite. You might also hear that he was an Idumean. That's just the Greek term for Edomite. So he was an Edomite. He had Abraham's blood running through him. But it went through Isaac and then Esau. Okay? So there's a relationship that Herod has with the nation of Israel. He's kind of related to them. Distant cousin. Now he is the king of the Jews. The Jewish people are very fastidious about heritage. Therefore, because Herod isn't really a Jew, more like that distant cousin, they don't really like him. They don't really accept him as their king. Even though his father had converted to Judaism, Herod was never fully accepted by the Jews. He was appointed to be king by the Roman Senate. And it was around 40 BC where he was appointed to be king, but he did not fully take reins of the kingship until about 37 BC. And then he reigned until about 4 BC. So he reigned about, really effectively, about 33 years. What we know about Herod is that Herod, he was a really savvy politician. He, it was amazing how he was able to stay in power all those years. One of the ways he did that was in um, uh, early in his reign, what he did in order to secure somewhat of the favor of the Jews is he divorced his wife and he married the granddaughter of the high priest. She was Jewish. So it would make him a little bit more tolerable having that connection to the high priest family. He also, if you remember, you remember the names Mark Antony? You ever heard of that guy? Cleopatra? Mark Antony and Cleopatra, they were in a power struggle against a, a man named Octavian. And what happened was Herod sided with Mark Antony and Cleopatra, and they lost. And Octavian defeated them. Octavian, his other name, what he became known as? Caesar Augustus. Octavian became the emperor, and it's not a good thing when you have been on the side of his opponent. But that's how savvy Herod was. He was able to convince Octavian 
he would be loyal to him. Just as he was loyal to Antony and Cleopatra. And Octavian received him. And he was able to remain the king. Not only is he um, known for being this savvy politician, Herod was known to be one of the greatest architectural builders in the ancient world. He built so many things, not only in Judea, but uh, in other places as well. He made, you know, bathhouses and uh, colonnades and marketplaces. He, uh, he built temples to many different gods, including the temple in Jerusalem. He built palaces, fortresses, aqueduct systems. Um, there's a PowerPoint I want to show you of one of his uh, more famous buildings. It's a, it's a PowerPoint. It's a, a place called the Herodium, named after him. It was built, uh, it was like his palace fortress, and it was built on the, uh, one of the tallest uh, mountains in that area. And then if you look at the next slide, this is kind of a uh, replica of what the Herodium would have looked like. Fascinating what this man was able to accomplish and build. There's a, there's a great uh, video I want to show you that gives you a, even a greater appreciation for some of his, uh, uh, what he built. And so um, what we're coming upon here is a place called Masada. And Masada, it was a fortress. It, was, it happened to be uh, of the place where eventually the, the Jews hid or, or held up when they were uh, being uh, attacked by the Romans. And uh, back in 1992, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Israel and I had a chance to go to Masada. It's a fascinating place. They held out, uh, the Jews held out for several years before the Romans were able to to overtake them. But on this place, <clears throat> Herod had built a palace. And we're going to see uh, that palace. It was tr uh, three levels. And what was interesting when I was there is when I, when I uh, you could still see some of the colored frescoes, tiles, they were still there. You could kind of see this tiered... Um, palace that he made. There are three tiers. It's an amazing structure. What was also cool is when I went to Masada, the boulders that the Romans used to tear it down, to, to catapult, were still there <coughs> on the grounds. <coughs> So now what we see is kind of uh, what they think the, the actual structure might have looked like uh, that Herod had built. He was so, uh, it, it was such an amazing place they had aqueducts, or not aqueducts, but a, a cistern system to, to collect the water. Isn't that amazing? It's an impressive, uh, impressive palace. So Masada overlooks the Judean desert. If you ever have a chance to go to Israel, that is definitely a place you want to go to. This next place is uh, Caesarea Maritima, and this is an aqueduct system that Herod had built. Uh, it didn't have any uh, uh, natural uh, fresh water, so he had to build this aqueduct system. This is a theater at, at um, 
Caesarea. Caesarea was named after Caesar. He had built several places to honor Caesar. One was Caesarea Maritima, the other was uh, Sebasti in Samaria. What you see kind of right here, it's called, that's going up right now, that's called the Hippodrome. A Hippodrome was where they would do horse races and chariot races. So he built a little place for like a, uh, a pool area there. What Herod accomplished was quite amazing. Herod was able to... Um, to build all of this, he, he taxed the people to, in order to, um, to fund all of this. And they were, they were oppressed. They, they had oppressive taxes. We think we have bad taxes. They had very oppressive taxes in order to build all these things. Herod, that was cool. Um, Herod, <clears throat> not only was he this savvy politician and amazing builder, he was ruthless. He was a ruthless ruler as well. He had 10 wives. Several of them he, he murdered. He had several sons. Three of them he killed, his own sons. Herod, um, it, it, it was said that he killed 45 of one of his uh, opponent's supporters. So uh, there was a, you know, someone by the name of Antiochus who was a, a political opponent of his and, he, and there, he took 45 of his supporters and had them slain. When Herod was near the end of his death, he was only a few days away from dying. He was so worried that when he died, that the people would celebrate his death. And so what he did was, he called the nobles of Judea, together to meet him at Jericho. And he had, there was, a, there was a hippodrome at Jericho, as well as at Caesarea Maritima, but he had them come to Jericho and meet him there. And what he did was, once they got there, he locked them in the hippodrome. And his plan was this. The moment he died, they were to be executed. And the reason was, is because if he could execute all these nobles, then no one would be celebrating his death. Everyone would be mourning. That was the thought process of this ruthless ruler. He murdered his own family, and yet he was very conscientious about keeping the Mosaic law. And so he refused to eat pork. And so the irony of it all is that he's, he would murder his own family but he was fastidious about not eating pork. And uh, Caesar Augustus made this comment. He said, I would rather be Herod's pig than his son. Interesting. What can we learn from Herod? Look at verse 3. It says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. See, when Herod got the news, when when the Magi came to Jerusalem asking, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? It says Herod was disturbed. And all Jerusalem with him. Why would all Jerusalem be disturbed? Well, it wasn't because they were 
worried about the type of king that was going to be born, they were disturbed because Herod was disturbed. You get it? When you have a ruthless king who's disturbed, you're disturbed. And there's something in that that speaks to us about power. There's something in that that speaks to us about maybe the way we use the power that God has given us. Some of us may have grown up in homes where you had parents, if they were disturbed, everyone was disturbed. I know people who grew up in homes when the dad would come home, and if he had a hard day at work, the first place he would go was to the liquor bottle. And after he got done with the liquor bottle, then he would turn to the kids. And if you grew up in that type of home, you kind of have a firsthand experience of what it means, what it looks like when power is abused. I think when we look at Herod, we see our power really needs to be used to build and not to destroy. In Proverbs 20, verse 2, it says, A king's wrath strikes terror like the roar of a lion. Those who anger him forfeit their lives. Boy, isn't that true of Herod? The king's anger, the king's wrath strikes terror in people. And sometimes when those people who are in power, they don't use that power in the way that God would want, this, want us to, what happens is, is that everybody else suffers the consequences. And that speaks to us. That speaks to each one of us. It speaks to you, if you're a parent, how you wield your power in your home. It speaks to you, if you're a boss, how you wield your power at the workplace. But, you know, we traditionally think of all these different folks that um, have traditional power. Like when I was in work, I remember my first job, I was working. I was a grunt accountant. I had, you know, I was in, in auditing, and there was this man who was a partner, and he was terrifying to me. Everybody was afraid of this guy because you could be sitting outside in your cubicle and there would be his office and people would be summoned into his office and you could hear what was going on through the walls. It was so, no one wanted to go into his office. He was in authority, but he wielded his power in such a way that it brought terror to people. You and I, when we look at Herod, we could ask ourselves, how do, we, how do we use the power that God has given us? What kind of people are we? And it's interesting because ten, we tend to think of, you know, well, parents have power over their kids. Do you know that kids also have power? I've watched kids use their own anger to control their parents. I've seen teenagers, the way they, they close down to their parents, they manipulate their parents. And that's an abuse of power. We all have that capacity to do things in the wrong way. God wants us to use the power he's given us to build, not to destroy. It's interesting when you look at those pictures that we saw, those palaces don't house royalty anymore. The aqueduct system doesn't bring fresh water anymore. The, the fortresses don't protect anyone anymore. All of these things were ruins. They are ruins now. They sit as monuments 
but they're all ruined. And it reminds us that if we're using our power in the wrong way, it reminds us that the things that we build our life around, these things oftentimes won't last. These things that we spend so much time upon, whether it's huge structures or huge portfolios, these things are not going to last. Herod reminds us of this. We look at Herod, and um, it's interesting because he sat on the throne. And he, like so many people, he misunderstood the heart of God. Because he felt threatened. He thought Jesus was going to take away his throne from him. Now, what I think we need to see is that Jesus wasn't interested in sitting on that throne in that palace. The throne that Jesus wanted was the throne of Herod's heart. That's the throne that God is after. The throne room of Jesus' kingdom is our hearts. I think that if Jesus wanted that throne room, then he would have been born into Caesar's family. But he wasn't. He was born into a carpenter's family. And that reminds us that Jesus really wants the heart of us. He wants us to open up to him. I think Proverbs 20, 28 would have been something that Jesus would have wanted Herod to know. It says in Proverbs 20, 28, love and faithfulness keep a king safe. Through love, his throne is made secure. I think Jesus would have loved it if Herod opened up his heart to him and he would have said, you know what, Herod, I want to show you how to rule. I want to show you what it means to be a righteous king. Have you surrendered the throne of your heart to the Lord? Now, what I'm asking is, not have you accepted Jesus as your Savior? Really, it goes even beyond that. Have you totally surrendered your heart to the Lord? Because that's what he wants. That's what he's after. How would we know? How do you know if you've surrendered your heart to the Lord? Let me give you some indications of what it might look like to have a heart that's surrendered to the Lord. Are you regularly meeting with other people to be encouraged by them and to encourage them to grow in the Lord? Are you regularly doing that? That's a great indication that your heart is surrendered to the Lord. Are you regularly tithing and giving to God's work to build his kingdom? That's another indication that your heart is surrendered to the Lord. Are you regularly sharing the gospel with those who are not yet Christians? That is an indication that you are surrendered to the Lord. Are you regularly and eagerly coming to worship God? On time. That is an indication that your heart is surrendered to the Lord. Are you regularly getting out of your comfort zone? Because you feel like God is calling you to do something or say something that you normally would not do, but that's kind of been a pattern of your life because you're listening to God. You regularly have that experience in your life. I think God wants us to live that way. What's the common denominator behind all, under all that? Regularly. Pattern. Consistency. Commitment. There's this way of life. See, some of us, instead of being regular, 
we're kind of these event Christians. We will say, well, I'll meet together with other Christians when we have an all church study, but outside of that, I'm not going to do it. Or we might say, you know what, when there's a special offering, I'll give. But we don't give tithes and offerings regularly. Or we might say, you know what, I'm going to serve when it fits my schedule. Or I'll, I'll participate in a special project, but I don't want to be committed to anything. I think God wants us to be regular, to be consistent, to be not just an event type of Christian. And that looks like the surrendered heart. That's the surrendered life. And I think if that describes you, if you feel like, you know what? I'm not regular. I'm There's not a pattern of my life that shows that I'm submitted to the Lord. Then God just says, just turn. Just repent from that. Just confess that. Repent from that. Repentance is such a good thing. Kind of uh, uh, this past week, we were in our staff meeting. And we were looking at what, uh, you know, we... Every week we look at the previous Sunday's service. And during the service, or during that uh, staff meeting, I just asked the question, you know, last Sunday, did it feel like there was a void? And it was interesting. Everybody said, yeah, yeah, something was missed. There was like, it was weird, like something was missing at church. And I thought, yeah, you know what? It just felt a little flat. And we kind of talked about that a little bit, and we started praying about that. And I know that the Spirit came upon me, and I had this, this conviction, this conviction that, you know what? Um, that reflects my heart. That I wasn't coming prepared in my heart wasn't coming prepared in my heart the way I needed to. And, um, you know, we just spent some time praying about that, and some some of the guys, they also just had that conviction of their own hearts as well. And it was a good time to just repent. It was a good time just to say, you know what? Yeah, I need to check my own heart when I come to worship because I want to live a surrendered life. I want to make sure that God is on the throne of my life. And when I start to lose that, I need to repent from it and come back to that place where I say, God, it's all about you. See, you could have made a commitment to Christ when you became a Christian, but there is a commitment that is a daily commitment, a moment-by-moment commitment that we make to the Lord. And it's very easy for us to say, yes, I'm a Christian because I pray to receive Jesus. But yet, when we look at our lives, we can't really say, I have surrendered my life and I am continually surrendering my life to the Lord. And so, It's good for us to recognize that, and it's good for us to say, you know what? I need to repent. I need to be honest and say, yes, there's something that I have held on to that I haven't surrendered. Are you surrendering to to the Lord? We've seen in this passage that um, our power, whatever power we have, it uh, it needs to be used to to build and not to destroy. And the throne of our heart, that's 
that's where Jesus wants to sit. But this passage also tells us that our sovereign king will establish his kingdom. Our sovereign king is establishing his kingdom. You know, it's interesting. Herod, he tried to trick the Magi, you know, saying, oh, I want to, tell me where the Christ is and I want to go worship him. And then God sends the Magi home by another route. Herod tries to have Jesus killed by slaughtering all the kids in Bethlehem. And yet God has that Mary and Joseph and Jesus escape to to Egypt. No matter what Herod did, God was always two steps ahead of him. God is sovereign. We even see in this passage, no less than three prophetic passages are fulfilled. The birthplace of Christ is fulfilled in this passage. We see that the prophetic word about how he would be uh, called out of Egypt was fulfilled in this passage. We see that even the slaughter of the innocent children was prophetically predicted in the Old Testament. And as we take a step back and we look at that, God is fulfilling his purposes. God is establishing his kingdom. And you and I, we could either be on the right side of that or we could be on the wrong side of that. Herod was on the wrong side of that. We could choose to be on the right side of that. We could choose to be a part of what God wants to do because he's doing it. He is fulfilling his purposes. He is establishing his kingdom. That's why in our mission statement, we talk about we want to join God in reaching and transforming people into passion followers of Christ. We want to join him. What does that mean? That means that God is at work. We believe that God is at work. We don't have to so much create a lot of things, but we have to understand what he's doing. Just like Jesus saw what his father was doing and he participated in it, we want to join God in his activity of bringing about his kingdom. Is that your heart? Is that what you want? It's fascinating when we reflect on Herod. Herod was this king, and he tried to hold on to his kingdom so tightly. And as we see, just like every other king, he lost it. It came to an end. He tried to immortalize himself through all these building projects that now lie in ruin. What's fascinating is that Herod, Josephus tells us that Herod was buried at the Herodium. The Herodium is about three miles away from Bethlehem. Herod died just a few years after Christ was born. And so you see this irony of ironies, that the king who tried to hold on to his kingdom so tightly laid buried just three miles from where the true king was born, the eternal king. The king who left his throne to come down to save us, the one who sits on the eternal throne, Herod missed him because he was so consumed with holding on to his own kingdom. And for you and I, I hope that we don't organize and live our lives around trying to build our own kingdom and miss out on the great privilege and joy of knowing the king and building his kingdom because that is the eternal one. That is the kingdom where there won't be ruins just left. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, I thank you so much that you came. Lord, you came 
And you show us through even the example of Herod how we ought to live our lives. Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, that you are sovereign, that you are fulfilling, you have fulfilled and you continue to fulfill the prophetic words that you have written in your word. And Lord, as we stand at this side of Advent, the first Advent, we look forward to the second Advent. We look forward to your second coming again. And Lord, we pray that we would live in, in, in right relationship to that truth. God, I pray for those of us who um, have power, and all of us do, but in the ways that you, know, you have given us uh, a measure of authority in our families, in our places of work, in our schools, on our teams, Lord, help us to use that in a way that honors you. God, we don't want to be people in the way we are that causes terror, that causes others to shudder, where people are so afraid when we are disturbed. Right now, I just pray for the parents. I, I just feel like there's some parents here who really struggle with their anger. I pray for you in Jesus' name. Because you know when you're disturbed, the whole family gets disturbed. Let's pray, God, right now that you would help them to repent. Help them to seek you, to seek your healing. I pray for, I, I, I pray right now for our teenagers too. For the way that um, some of them may be controlling their parents. And the way they're um, withdrawing. The way that they're um, expressing themselves. Lord, I pray that they would, they would use their power in a way that is righteous and good and holy. Pray for those who have been um, given the opportunity to be leaders at their workplaces of work, who have people under them. I pray that the way that they lead would not be based on fear and intimidation. I pray that they would lead like you do, that they would be lifters. Lord God, I pray, God, that we would all surrender to you. That there are places in our hearts that we have not given over to you, Lord. I pray that we would do that. Lord, give us a hunger for you. A hunger that uh, surpasses all other hungers. Mm. Lord, thank you that you are sovereign and you are accomplishing your purposes too. Help us to walk in that, to embrace that, and to partner with you, to join you in your work so that we might be part of the eternal kingdom. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name.